1617, war broke out again between the Swedes and the Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth. The fickle truce of 1611 failed, and a conflict ensued that lastingly changed the balance of power in Europe. In this war, the famous Swedish king Gustavus Adolphus pitched his newly reformed army against the yet-to-be-defeated forces of the Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth. This forced the Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth into a defensive position. However, the famous winged hussars were ready to take on Gustavus. While they were some of the most powerful tools in warfare in the early modern period, they wouldn't be of much help today. For that, you need NordVPN, which is one of the most reputable VPN providers on the market. In Germany, they were even ranked as the best VPN provider in May of 2020. We've been using Nord for a while now and never ran into any problems. So we're pretty happy that they chose to sponsor this video. For those not in the know, VPNs secure your connection to the internet, allow you to circumvent geoblocking, for example, if certain games or TV shows are not available in your country, and prevent your internet service provider from slowing down your streaming speed. VPNs are an absolute basic necessity these days. And you may ask, why NordVPN? Well, Nord is faster than other VPNs. It's easy to use and works on all common devices, and most importantly, is secure. They even offer a double VPN, which means you can route your traffic through two VPN servers. All of that is available to you with a 73% discount and one month for free, if you use the link in the pinned comment. And if you're unhappy, Nord offers a 30-day money-back guarantee. So no time to waste, go check it out. In the years of peace from 1611 to 1617, King Gustavus Adolphus of Sweden had been stabilizing his country and his own power. He terminated two of the three conflicts he had inherited, namely those with Muscovy and Denmark, and he well established himself on the Swedish throne. In the eyes of most European rulers, however, Gustavus was still seen as a usurper, because Gustavus' father had deprived Sigismund III of his birthright to the Swedish throne. While Gustavus was not recognized internationally, the relationships he built with the Swedish nobility were firmer than those of any of his predecessors. This allowed him to work on profound reforms, which were to turn his country into a mighty empire. He expanded Swedish trade and made a lot of progress on the diplomatic stage. Most importantly, he established a stable alliance with the Low Countries. According to the historian Stuart Oakley, this would, quote, become a cornerstone of his foreign policy for some time. While Denmark remained the dominant power in the Baltic in the eyes of Europe, the balance was beginning to shift in favor of Sweden. The Danish Baltic Sea Dominion was slowly becoming the Swedish Baltic Sea Dominion. But not all was well just yet. The costs of the war against Muscovy and Denmark weighed heavily on the Swedish treasury. And there was a third quarrel, the lasting conflict with Sigismund and the Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth. The Commonwealth, too, was not in full shape. It had just started a campaign against Muscovy to replace the Russian Tsar Mikhail Romanov with the Polish Prince Vladislav. Meanwhile, Tatars and Ottomans stood on the Commonwealth's southern borders. And finally, the Livonian nobility was discontent with their Polish-Lithuanian overlords. Some nobles even preemptively negotiated with the Swedes so that in case of hostilities between Sweden and the Commonwealth, they would surrender the fortress of Daugav Griva to the invaders. In 1617, the truce ran out. Gustavus grasped the opportunity and launched an attack on Livonia. The city of Daugav Griva indeed opened its gates soon after the Swedes arrived. The main Swedish army then took Pernu. By late August, the Swedes had occupied almost all of Livonia, with the exception of Riga. The Commonwealth sent Krzysztof Radziwiłł, the son of the Thunderbolt, to push back against the Swedes, and he was very successful. By the end of 1617, his men had recaptured all important Livonian strongholds except Pernu. Meanwhile, the Swedish resources proved insufficient to have another go at Riga. One of the main reasons for this was the immense ransom the Swedish had to pay for the return of Elfsborg, which had been conquered by Denmark in 1612. Therefore, Gustavus tried to get Dutch, English and even Danish support against the Commonwealth in the winter of 1617 and 18. 
Even though he was stressing the common interests of all Protestant states in the fight against a Catholic enemy, his diplomatic attempts failed. The Swedish king realized the campaigns of 1617 and 1618 had shown that the Swedish army was still no match for the men of the Commonwealth. As a result, Gustavus signed a two-year truce in September of 1618, when the Thirty Years' War had already begun spreading across Europe. At this point, Gustavus was even considering to surrender Parnu if Sigismund had let go of his claim to the Swedish throne. But the Polish king had none of it. Sigismund had just managed to wrap up his conflict with the Muscovites by signing a truce with them in 1618. He was now in control of Smolensk and he was going to commit more of his troops to the north. However, two years later, Sigismund was again forced to split his troops. After nearly 200 years of peace, war broke out between the Ottoman Empire and the Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth over the control of Moldavia. Again, the Commonwealth was tied up on multiple fronts. The major battle against the Ottomans was fought at Hotin in 1621. In this battle, the Ottomans assaulted a very strong defensive position of the Commonwealth troops, but continuously failed to penetrate it. After about a month of struggle and immense losses on both sides, a peace was signed. The Polish-Ottoman War ended. According to the Polish historian Pavel Brzezdziecki, quote, the Commonwealth emerged very weak from the war. Huge losses were suffered and the treasury was largely empty." End quote. The Battle of Hotin is considered the first time the Ottomans had been defeated in a land battle in more than two generations. However, the Commonwealth lost an experienced commander, namely Jan Karol Hotkiewicz, who had previously bested the Swedes repeatedly in Livonia under less than ideal circumstances. With the troops of the Commonwealth bound on the southern border and the truce of 1618 expiring in 1620, the time was ripe for the Swedish king to renew the war in Livonia. In August 1621, Gustavus's fleet landed near Pernu. According to the historian Robert Frost, this was by far the biggest Swedish army that had set foot on Livonian soil. 148 ships brought about 18,000 men across the Baltic Sea, of which roughly 3,200 were cavalry. But this army was not only bigger, it was also more formidable than any other before. In the years of truce, Gustavus had been implementing further military reforms. The Swedish army had become one of the most progressive forces of the time. When it arrived, this military Goliath immediately marched south to lay siege to the city of Riga. Riga was well supplied with arms, ammunition and food but only defended a garrison of 300 supported by a militia of 3,700 citizens. Despite being vastly outnumbered, the defenders of Riga refused to hand over the city to the Swedes. The siege began with a heavy artillery bombardment that weakened both the walls and the garrison. Gustavus's men were slowly digging a network of trenches and fortifications, and were in this manner making their way towards the city walls. By the end of August, the walls began crumbling, and the siege works had advanced to a point where the Swedes could begin to install crossings over the wet ditch surrounding the city. When these were finished, Gustavus ordered a first assault. This attack, however, was fended off by the defenders. Meanwhile, the Lithuanian hetman Krzysztof Raciwiu was doing his best to harass the Swedes. However, he had only 1,500 men at his disposal, and could not do much against the superior numbers and the sturdy entrenchments of the Swedes. Even though Radziwiu did not really threaten the Swedish siege, Gustavus wanted things to move forward quickly and sent a negotiator to the city. But while hour after hour was passing, the man did not return. The Swedish king became impatient and ordered another assault. This time, the Swedes captured a large section of the city walls. It looked like a great success. The defenders, however, had been expecting this. They had prepared mines under the walls, which they blew up when the victorious Swedes occupied the walls. The Swedes were thrown out again. After three days, the negotiator finally returned and announced that the people of Riga were not willing to surrender because they didn't trust a king who ordered an assault during negotiations. So the fight continued. 
cannonballs were raining down on the walls of the city for another week. Then a second negotiator was sent to the defenders. At this point, Riga's defenses were worn down, all reserves quickly shrinking, and the defenders were totally exhausted. The only means left to the defenders was to protract the negotiations until, hopefully, help would arrive. Gustavus granted an extension of the negotiation ceasefire twice, but on the 25th of September the citizens could no longer postpone the decision. They surrendered to the Swedish king. The Baltic city, with which the Swedes had been having such a tough time in this and previous campaigns, finally fell into Swedish hands. Riga was the first major impactful victory of Gustavus's campaign. It was swiftly followed by the occupation of Daugav Griva on the 2nd of September. From there, the Swedes entered the duchy of Kurland and Semigallia, marching whenever they could through forests and marshes, because these terrains limited the movement of the Lithuanian cavalry. Without much resistance, they took the duchy's capital Mitava, modern-day Jelgava, and then proceeded to Koknese, but a Lithuanian cavalry detachment prevented them from capturing it. At this point, Gustavus entered negotiations with Sigismund. It seems like the Swedish king was willing to exchange the fruits of his conquest, which were of great strategic and economic importance, for an official recognition to his right to the Swedish throne by Sigismund. There were a number of good reasons for such an offer. The financial burdens of the war took its toll on the Swedish treasury. The situation in Central Europe was extremely unstable, and connected to that, the strategic security of not again ending up in multiple conflicts at the same time. The last point was strongly supported by Gustavus's closest consultants. The commander-in-chief Jacob de la Gardie and his chancellor Oxenstierna. However, no agreement was reached until January 1622. Almost two years later, when Volmar and a number of small castles in its surroundings fell to the Swedes in a new offensive, that Swedish offensive, though, didn't last. According to the expert on Baltic warfare, Stuart Oakley, Gustavus's men were constantly threatened by light cavalry, weakened by sickness, and financial resources were scarce. In addition, Rachiviu's forces had grown to 3,000 men. With this augmented force, the Lithuanians could now react much better to the Swedish attacks and even went on the offensive themselves. They recaptured the town of Mitava but couldn't conquer its castle because they lacked artillery. In July, some weeks after the garrison of the castle had finally given in, Gustavus's main army arrived. The ensuing battle soon turned into a stalemate, and another truce was signed. The Commonwealth had to cede the Duchy of Livonia north of the Dvina River to Sweden. Also, the Commonwealth only retained nominal control over the southeastern territories near Riga, as well as the Duchy of Kurland, Sweden was victorious, a truce was signed, but the conflict was not solved yet at all. Sigismund was furious, but he had no means to launch a counterattack immediately. His lands were being ravaged by plague, famine and various raids. Moreover, the same, the parliament of the Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth, wasn't willing to grant him the money he would have needed. Only after some months, in 1623, Rumors of him planning a direct attack on Sweden were again spreading. He wanted to join forces with the Habsburgs of Spain and bring 10,000 men to Stockholm, as well as a smaller force to Göteborg. Many Polish nobles were against this. The city of Gdansk, too, from which Sigismund intended to commission ships, strongly opposed the idea of a Commonwealth fleet and didn't lend its ports to him. In the end, all that resulted from Sigismund's plans was a minor extension of the small harbour in Puk and a modest fleet of seven medium ships which were being built from 1624 to 1626. The truce lasted until 1625. When it came to an end, Gustavus set out for Livonia again and again brought an even bigger army. On the 27th of June 1625, 20,000 soldiers arrived in Livonia. 10,000 of them marched along the river Dvina and laid siege to Koknese. This time the town capitulated after six days. 
The Swedes marched on and quickly won Tartu, Mitava and the rest of Livonia, north of the Dvina. Because Gustavus now obviously intended to keep his conquests rather than use them to negotiate, he now went even further and invaded the Grand Duchy of Lithuania. On the 7th of September, the Swedes captured Birzai, and on the 17th, the fortress of Bauska. The Swedes now controlled the Dvina line and managed to isolate the remaining Commonwealth troops north of it. Some, however, kept fighting. Late in 1625, Krzysztof Radziwiłł took back several minor castles from Swedish control in Kurland. Meanwhile, another important hetman, Lev Sapiha, was fending off a Swedish assault on Daugav Pils. However, these two influential commanders were divided by a personal dispute and didn't exactly work hand in hand with each other. Gustavus, well aware of this, chose to focus his forces on one of them. At the turn of the year, he gathered his men near Valle, also known as Valhof, where Sapiha had made camp. On a cold winter morning, Gustavus and his 3,100 men laid eye on the tents of the Lithuanians. The king himself held, for the first time, superior command. He immediately recognized that Sapiha had chosen the site unwisely. The Lithuanian camp consisted of 2,000 to 7,000 men, depending on the source. It was positioned between two dense woods, which meant the outflanking maneuvers the cavalry of the Commonwealth had used with much efficacy against the Swedes in the past was impossible in this case. Moreover, the Swedish infantry could even take cover behind the trees and provide flanking fire when Sapiha's cavalry would charge them. When dawn broke on the 17th of January, Gustavus's army launched a surprise attack on the camp. Just in time, a Polish patrol spotted them. Sapiha quickly prepared his men for the attack and set the nearby village on fire. The Swedes approached over a slight elevation and opened the battle with a cavalry charge on their right wing. The Lithuanians stood strong, but the Swedish musketeers advanced quickly and were soon all over them. In the end, Sapiha's men stood no chance against the well-coordinated deployment of the Swedish army. The Commonwealth lines broke and while the men were fleeing the field, Gustavus' Finnish cavalry hunted them down. The Battle of Valhof is considered the example to showcase the effects of the Swedish military reforms. In this view, the Swedes defeated the Polish-Lithuanian forces in open battle for the first time. However, this interpretation is questionable, as it was rather a surprise attack on a field camp than a pitched battle. However, the Battle of Valhof was a setback for the Commonwealth. The Lithuanians now limited their resistance to small-scale operations such as attacks on Swedish patrols harassing supply lines and occasional skirmishes. Gustavus, in contrast, was pleased with the performance of his soldiers and kept pushing deeper into Commonwealth territory. His ultimate goal was to force Sigismund into signing an unfavorable peace. Poland should be cut off its main grain outlet, deprived of naval bases from where attacks on Sweden could be launched and relief Livonia, which had long suffered from the burdens of war. If Gustavus wanted to realize these harsh terms, he needed to push into one specific region. Gustavus took the war to royal Prussia. <laughs>